and House Speaker Mike Johnson met with students at Columbia University and calling for the president of that school to resign. Joining us now live is NTD's White House correspondent, Iris Tao, who is on Columbia's campus as we speak. Iris, how did the speaker's press conference go today? Good evening to you, Steve. So the press conference was actually pretty heated and honestly quite chaotic. Speaker Johnson was met with student protesters who were chanting that they cannot hear him and that he needs to go, that he's not a good speaker. All kinds of like this chanting went on for the entire presser. Here's just a little bit of it. Let's take a look. It does not matter who shouts in our faces. We're going to do what is right by America. My message to the students inside the encampment is get, go back to class and stop the nonsense. Stop wasting your parents' money. So that was Speaker Johnson's message to them, telling them they need to go back to class as well as stop wasting their parents' money. And that's as these student protests kept escalating here on Columbia's campus. Speaker Johnson today calling on the president here to resign, saying that she's not doing a good job in protecting Jewish students. Johnson also says that she met with the president briefly before in this press conference, but is convinced that she's not taking strong actions going forward. And also Speaker Johnson says after this, she's going to call President Biden and ask him to take executive action to address the situation here. President Biden has condemned what he called anti-Semitic protests, but also says he condemns, quote, those who are not understanding who's, um, th those going on with the Palestinians. So it's a two-sided con condemnation from President Biden, one that President Trump has criticized as not being very strong and effective, saying that President Biden is not knowing what side he is actually supporting. Steve. So, Iris, these ongoing protests are now at, uh, obviously at the center of the political discussion and debate. Uh, how has Israel ultimately responded to these student protests on American campuses? Right, so the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today posted a video on X saying that these student protesters are mobs happening on American campus. Here's a look of what he was saying. Watch. What's happening on America's college campuses is horrific. Anti-Semitic mobs have taken over leading universities. It has to be condemned and condemned unequivocally. But that's not what happened. The response of several university presidents was shameful. And Prime Minister Netanyahu also acknowledged that some local and federal officials here in the U.S. have been speaking out against these protests, but he says more needs to be done. Back to you, Steve. And to you, Zyrus Tao, great reporting from right at the epicenter of these protests okay. at Columbia University in New York. Thank you, Iris. And as anti-Israel protests continue to unfold on college campuses across the nation, reaction is also pouring in from students to government officials to everyday Americans. Here's a look at what they have to say. We've seen chants of Yehudim, or Jews in Hebrew, go away, go back to Poland. They've called us colonizers. They've said we don't have a culture. They've called us al Qassam's next targets, and they've chanted for Tel Aviv to be burned to the ground by Hamas. I'm scared. I'm scared both for America. I'm scared for the Jews and very painful for, for our young people. We cannot uh, fight to say save lives while we are saying let's destroy lives. It echoes a huge responsibility now um, that many of my colleagues are calling for, that these university presidents across the country step up and provide a safe space for all students. The pro-Palestinian protests have spread from New York campuses to those in California, stretching across the country, Michigan, Texas, and Florida. Dozens were arrested in New York, but encampments continue to pop up. Columbia University said all classes at its main campus will be hybrid for the rest of the semester. And President Biden signing the $95 billion foreign aid package that provides funding for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Also is forcing TikTok to divest from its Chinese parent company or face a ban in all U.S. app stores. NTD's Jack Bradley joins us now live from the White House with more. Good evening, Jack. So now that this foreign aid package has been signed into law, what steps is President Biden taking to put it into action? Good evening, Steve. President Biden uh, signed that law just right here this morning at the White House and uh, promised immediately uh, to send a billion dollars in weapons to Ukraine. Uh, now, most of this aid is going to be going to Ukraine, about $61 billion of it. Meanwhile, $26 billion is heading to Israel 
and over $8 billion to Taiwan. Here's President Biden this morning. And it's an investment in our own security. Because when our allies are stronger, and I want to make this point again and again, when our allies are stronger, we are stronger. Now, this package also includes a separate measure that forces TikTok to divest from its Chinese owner, ByteDance, or be banned on U.S. app stores. It has about a year to do so. Now, that's because of data privacy concerns, as uh, the Chinese regime can access TikTok's user data for anyone who uses TikTok in the world. Uh, meanwhile, State Department uh, Secretary Antony Blinken is in China, and among many things he'll be discussing are human rights. Now, the State Department earlier this week just released a report on China's human rights documenting the atrocities they've committed and are still committing today against the Uyghurs and Falun Gong, which is a spiritual practice based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. Here's Vedant Patel, uh, the Deputy Secretary uh, spokesperson at the State Department. On the Secretary's visit to China, uh, he said he would address human rights, uh, but on this uh, report, uh, that came out on Monday. Will he specifically address the persecution of religious groups like uh, the Uyghurs and Falun Gong? And uh, what have talks been like on this in the past? So uh, what I can say is that in every engagement that we have had with the uh, People's Republic of China since the onset of this administration, human rights um, have always been on the agenda and they will continue uh, to be so. Uh, and I have no doubt that human rights will be discussed um, this week while the secretary is there. Now, Steve, this all comes on the anniversary of 1999's April 25th incident, uh, which is when 10,000 Falun Gong practitioners went to Beijing to protest the arrest of Falun Gong practitioners in China. Um, they, uh, the CCP, the Chinese regime, has used this incident since then to es escalate the persecution against Falun Gong, which still continues in China today. Steve? Entities Jack Bradley with that live report from the White House. Thank you, Jack. And now that President Biden has signed that hard-fought foreign aid package into law, how will it ultimately impact the war in Ukraine? And how do we expect China to react to the requirement that TikTok may not be under their control? To discuss the implications of the package, we spoke with former Republican Congressman Doug Collins. Congressman, on Tuesday, and with bipartisan support, uh, the Senate passed the hard-fought and long-awaited $95 billion package uh, of four bills for aid for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan. If you could, break down for us what this means for each of these countries and for U.S. military stockpiles and why Ukraine got the lion's share of the aid nearly two and a half times what was approved for Israel. The, the monies that go go for replenishment mainly of supplies, such as ammo, missiles, uh, air defense, those kind of things you know, going into this process. You, the issue, and I'll just take Israel first, the Iron Dome, uh, David Sling, the rest of this, this is where they buy the, the vast majority of that from us, so it's replacing stock that they have that comes from our supplies as well. The Taiwan uh, Indochina issue, that's a little bit different, more as a precautionary tale against peer-to-peer uh, -peer with China. Now, Ukraine's a little different. Ukraine is actually getting a lot of hardware uh, that will be coming in, not only just the guns and ammo, but also equipment, uh, tanks, possibly, I think, some, uh, some uh, fortified vehicles, the other things that are coming in that, and they're already going to be shipping out. The vast majority of that money is, again, Israel is something that keeps their own systems up. Ukraine has been in a, a war now for two years, so you're seeing a replenishment in a real uh, battle with Russia. So as you look at this going forward, the reason that Ukraine's was bigger, uh, whether you agree with it or not, was just the bigger scope of the battle that they are having and the needs, which are more land-based. Uh, very much of a more, I hate to even say this, because, but it's become true, a trench warfare kind of setting in Ukraine. Well, at least we know that there's one former congressman that's reading all of the bills. Um, included in the fourth bill uh, of this foreign aid package, the so-called sidecar bill, is potentially a nationwide ban on, on TikTok if it's, if it's Chinese parent company ByteDance refuses to sell within, I believe it's nine months now. The Chinese embassy congressman lobbied congressional staff against this bill using TikTok as a fear-mongering device to push its users to lobby Congress against the bill. What do you expect will be China's next move? And will TikTok ultimately be able to delay this through any type of litigation? Yes, you're going to see this litigated all the way probably to the Supreme Court. I, I can see this heading uh, that far um, because they've already litigated this in some state cases and some others, and actually TikTok is one. 
So this is a First Amendment issue. However, there is a national security item to this, and I think this is something that TikTok's such a public facing company, if you would, that people like to see their friends dancing. They like to see the stuff on it. So they don't view it as having a backdoor, so to speak, to the CCP and the in the in the communists in China who are taking all of this information and also funneling what Americans see. I think if Americans really understood that what they see on their TikTok feed is not what Chinese uh uh, users see, I think they would begin to understand why this is a, a really a concern uh, going forward. At the end of the day, it depends on how they want to handle this. If it's such an important tool for the Chinese Communist Party, you'll see it litigated a, a, a whole lot, um, and they'll see where that goes. If they think that it is more of a you know propaganda piece or it's more of just a, a sales piece, you could possibly see some kind of a sale. Uh, come into that as well. But then again, even with a sale, you need to make sure that the basic hardware functions, everything else are not still lined up with going directly to Beijing. Switching gears a bit to another major story to get your thoughts on these anti-Semitic pro protests that we're seeing uh, spreading across the country and resulting in significant disruptions at our universities like Columbia, New NYU, New York University, both of which have moved to hybrid classes, seen a large number of students arrested. You have House Speaker Mike Johnson planning a visit to Columbia today to discuss these troubling uh, rise in, in virulent anti-Semitism instances on America's college campuses. How can universities be more proactive in ensuring the safety and maintaining order? These are pro-Hamas uh, agitators that are getting mixed in with college kids, many of which, if you look at some interviews that have been done, they're not even sure why they're there. They just say something about Israel and, and Hamas, and this is it. But this is a Hamas terrorist kind of generated activity that takes away uh, focus of what's really happening in the Israel Gaza Strip, what happened on October 7th. The way they can do it is, again, why don't we defend everybody's rights on a campus? Why is it that it's okay for anti-Semitic speech to run rampant in the name of protest, but yet, you know, nothing is said about the Jewish students on campus and being told that they need to die, take their own life, Israel doesn't need to exist, this, you know, again, we wouldn't tolerate that in any other format. Could you imagine the outrage on a campus if a, a KKK group or a, a skinhead kind of group would go onto a historically black college campus and make racial threats and overtones? They would be done in a minute, in an instant. Former Georgia Congressman uh, Doug Collins, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Capitol Report. If you want to see our full broadcast, check us out at epochtv.com.